All right, hi everyone. Well, welcome to uh, today's FBA panel. Uh, my name is Stephen Lee, and I'd like to first of all just thank you all for being here with us today. Um, I hope we, uh, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. And before before I get started, I want to take a moment to encourage the lawyers among you to become a member of the Federal Bar Association's Chicago chapter. Uh, membership in the FBA Chicago chapter has many benefits. Our chapter is distinguished, first of all, by the high level of involvement of our federal judiciary. Membership in the FBA is a great way to get better acquainted with our local federal judges. Uh, we are proud to host, in particular, the Northern District's annual State of the Court Address delivered by our chief judge. Our chapter also offers many high quality CLE programs. Our recent programs include Employment Law Seminar, Home Run Motion, Business Development, and a government careers panel. We've got several exciting programs to come in the future, including effective virtual settlement advocacy with our magistrate judges. Now, in a typical year, we host popular informal lunches with federal judges in their chambers, as well as a number of free events for our members, including the Moran Membership Appreciation Event, our holiday party, and our ethics program offering many hours of free professional responsibility CLE. Now, we're not in typical year, of course, and in these highly atypical times, chapter membership has also provided a unique and excellent opportunity for people to engage in interesting legal programs and network during a time of limited social contact, such as this program we're hoping to do today. So I encourage you to consider joining the FBA Chicago chapter. If you're interested, you can go to the FBA's website, www.fedbarchicago.org. All right. So I want to begin this session by thinking, stepping back and thinking about kind of what we do as lawyers. Now, as lawyers, we spend a lot of time in law school training by thinking about legal principles and nuances of the law. We read lots of judicial opinions about how cases were decided, but this is not the way that much of the legal practice actually works. Much of the real work of litigation is about finding the facts that we apply legal principles and arguments to. In real life, facts don't just get handed to you in a nice little packet or an undisputed statement. You have to go out and find the facts. And if you don't see the right facts, you're not gonna have the right material for your legal arguments. And it's something that I think is underappreciated and underestimated by lawyers and non-lawyers alike. So before I get into Sherlock Holmes, I wanna point out there's two quotes that I think about a lot actually in this regard. First of all, there's a quote from the legal scholar Blackstone. Um, he was talking more about, uh, about civil cases, but this applies to civil cases and criminal cases. Experience will abundantly show that above 100 of our lawsuits arise from disputed facts for one, where the, where the law is disputed out. And he was basically making the point that a lot of the cases that actually get litigated hinge on factual arguments, not really on legal arguments. Or as, the, or as Yale Law School professor John Langbin put it, find the facts and the law is usually easy. So I think about these quotes a lot when I think about fact gathering and the importance they have, that has in terms of the actual work of litigation and investigation. I was a federal prosecutor for 11 years, and I was able to charge some complicated cases, in part because I and the people I worked with were able to dive into the facts in detail, sometimes observing things that other people had missed. And as a defense lawyer now in private practice, I've helped, helped clear people, in part by realizing where investigations had been sloppy and had missed crucial information. Now, all this brings me to Sherlock Holmes who helped catch many criminals in his time, and who also cleared people who had been wrongfully accused of crimes as well. Now, when I read all the stories for the first time a few years ago, I was surprised at what I found there. Sherlock Holmes was not some magician or superhero, but he was someone who had trained himself in real practical ways to become a great detective. On his own, Holmes has figured out how to make himself an expert in solving crimes. 
And he had lots of good wisdom for investigators of all types. Now, he meant this in his stories for other detectives, but I think a lot of what was said in those stories is extremely useful for lawyers and non-lawyers alike. And that's what I want to share with you all here today. So I want to begin with a study in Scarlet. Now, this was the first of the four Sherlock Holmes novels that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote, uh, along with about 50, 50 to 60 stories that he wrote as well. But Studying Scarlet is the very first one. And this is, the, uh, this is the story that really lays out a lot of what we know about Sherlock Holmes. And I think it offers a lot of great material for this kind of discussion. Now, the bad guy's backstory has not aged well in this story. And it does play into some unfortunate prejudices and misinformation of the era. But the overall story is great. It holds up. And I highly recommend that you give it a read if you haven't read it already. And this is a story that begins with Sherlock Holmes meeting Dr. John Watson for the first time and de determining that John Watson had served in Afghanistan just by observing little things about his appearance upon their first meeting. Then, after they start rooming together, Sherlock Holmes gets called by the police to the scene of a bloody murder that takes place at a house. And when he's there, he's able to observe certain things about the murder scene. And by the time he leaves the murder scene and conducts some initial investigation, he's actually very sure about who the murderer was and has figured out what's happened. So that brings us to the first of the three main questions that I plan to cover here today. And that is basically thinking about how does Sherlock Holmes know what to look for? How does he know what to see and observe to help him reach these conclusions and observations about Dr. Watson or about the murder scene or about this crime that he was called upon to investigate. And it, basically, we can look to what Sherlock Holmes himself said in a lot of these cases. So there are two quotes from a study in Scarlet that I think are actually useful to keep in mind. First of all, if you have all the details of a thousand misdeeds at your finger ends, it is odd if you can't understand the thousand and first. And basically, what Sherlock Holmes is talking about here is that prior to solving this murder, he's studied very closely how other cases have been solved, how other murders were investigated and determined, and that he's using the knowledge he gained from those other cases, to, and he's applying that to this murder scene that he walks into for the very first time. Another quote that kind of goes along the same lines. Read it up. Read it up. You really should. There is nothing new under the sun. It has all been done before. And what he's talking about there is basically no matter what kind of crime or case that he's working on, there's probably something similar he can draw upon in terms of investigating and checking into his case. And so for here, one thing that I think about when I think about these quotes and this kind of idea is the idea that basically whenever you're starting a case, whenever you're starting to gather information, you don't have to start from scratch. You can see how other people have handled similar cases because there probably is some similar case around. So, and this, so some practical ideas for how to do that. First of all, I think it's always a useful exercise to go around and ask around and try to find colleagues who might have done similar type cases, investigated similar type incidents, and try to build upon what people have done. The very first time that I investigated a bank robbery case when I was a prosecutor, I really didn't know what to look for. But the fifth or sixth time that I did, I had a much better sense of what to look for. And also I could draw, and every single time I was able to draw upon the wisdom of other people who had handled other cases before me. Another thing you can do is, I think, actually think step back and think about the resources that are actually available through sources like PACER. I think a lot of lawyers are very comfortable with basically going online to Lexis or Westlaw and finding judicial opinions that kind of go to the issues they want to talk about or looking into. But I also highly encourage you to look at PACER, to look at basically how those opinions came about. Look at the complaint, look at the motion, look at the arguments that the litigators did in order to get those judicial results. 
Because those are the kinds of things that litigators and lawyers, those are the things that you're going to be looking at in order to try to persuade the judges in your particular cases. So again, look at what, build upon what people have done before you in similar situations. Because if you go around, you probably can find something similar to what you're looking at. And so I think this is something that, again, this is something that Sherlock Holmes himself did. He actually recommends in one story to a young investigator that this is what's basically the best thing he could do. Spend a year reading up on how other crimes have been solved and use that as the basis for how you will go about solving your crime. The next thing that comes through from the Sherlock Holmes stories, and the next thing, the, pra thing, the next bit of practical advice that I think he offers is that when he's investigating a case, he knows what the baseline is, and he knows about the world he's investigating, and he knows how it works. Now, this comes up in a story, uh, the, story the story involving Silver Blade. And this is where Holmes has a conversation with Inspector. And the inspector asks, is there any point to which you would draw my attention? Holmes, to the curious incident of the dog in the nighttime. Inspector, the dog did nothing in the nighttime. Holmes, that was a curious incident. So lawsuits, criminal cases, they're about things that went wrong. People don't go to court when everything works exactly as they should. There's usually some kind of breakdown in how things were supposed to be. And that's what your cases are going to be about. So it's really important, I think, to step back and make sure you really understand how the cases, how life is supposed to work. In this instance, Holmes knows he's investigating a, a crime, and he knows that if some stranger came in to commit the crime, the dog would have barked at night. The dog didn't bark. And then because that happened, because there wasn't this barking, he, that's a clue that he's able to observe because he is very familiar with how things are supposed to go in the normal course of events. That's something that you should keep in mind when you're investigating or any type of case. Really understand how things are supposed to go, and that helps you determine better where things deviated, where things went wrong. Another point on this, it's actually make sure you also understand as you proceed with the case that your audience, your eventual audience, understands the same baseline. There are things that you and your clients will understand and know that are wrong, but the, the judge or the jury down the road might not. So it's important to make sure that they understand and work from the same baseline that you do as you go. All right. Next. One thing that Holmes does, and I, I, and I highlight that as, as a great advice for all kind of investigators, is he changes his perspective as he investigates the case. And there's, he talks about this in several ways, and he, he does this several different, different, different directions. One quote, what is out of the common is usually a guide rather than a hindrance. In solving a problem of this sort, the grand thing is to be able to reason backward. He's able, Everyone, when he comes into a case, he's coming in after the crime has been committed, after the bad deed has been done, and he needs to then be able to work backwards and figure out what happened. And, try, and the way to, one way to do that is to reason backwards and try to put yourself into the other, into the perpetrator's uh, foot, footprints, footsteps. So that's one perspective shift that he makes when he's investigating a case. Another thing, another quote, another idea, take on that. You know my methods in such cases, Watson. I put myself in the man's place, and having first gauged his intelligence, I try to imagine how I myself should have proceeded under the same circumstances. Again, really, he's taking the time to shift his perspective and look at it from the way that the perpetrator would have, and then try to reconstruct the steps to see where he can find the evidence he needs. This is something that I think about a lot when it comes to email review and document review, a huge part of modern litigation practice, modern investigation, that really wasn't a part of Sherlock Holmes' era. And it's something I think about because it helps to think about how the people, when you're reviewing emails, when you're searching emails, I find it's very helpful to think about how the people writing the emails would have thought, how they would have approached things. 
they're not necessarily going to type things in perfectly crafted emails with perfect spelling that matches the search terms that you might be coming up with down the road. And so a big part, I think, of doing a good review of these kind of documents is to really step back and really figure out how do the people writing these emails or text messages, how did they operate and think? What was their way of communicating? And I think that actually is very useful in terms of trying to figure out the right documents, to find the right documents. Um, one thing that I've done in a lot of my cases is actually notice that a lot of times there can be very highly relevant emails. Um, I sometimes find them by just looking up curse words because that is those can be times when people are a little more careless and might make some, make some crucial admissions that they wouldn't have made in other instances. So I found sometimes very relevant, very damaging documents by looking up curse words and then seeing the circumstances for those emails or text messages, because that helps me explain that, what, what was really going on. And fourth, uh, Holmes focuses on details and facts, not opinions. And he especially does not take necessarily into account or give too much credit to someone else's opinions. If I take it up, I must understand every detail that he take time to consider. The smallest point may be the most essential. What he's looking for when he's done the investigation, he's looking for details. He's looking for the specific information, not the generalizations, because he needs the material in order to really kind of understand what happened. And he needs to be able to pick apart things from his point of view, building upon all the knowledge he has from all those other cases he studied. So that's why for him, it really is important to get the details and this kind of level of, of information, not just relying on other people. So we can see this play out in many different ways in the Sherlock Holmes stories. But I thought I'd actually use one particular example um, here as a, for you all. So one thing that I believe is extremely important in modern investigation or any kind of investigation is interviewing people. Now, as lawyers, you will conduct depositions of people, you will do the direct examinations and cross examinations. But long before many of those things happen, you might just be interviewing people, you know, not in a formal setting, but trying to gather up information, gather information from your clients, from various people, trying to figure out what happened long before you might actually even begin litigation. And so I think interviewing is an extremely important skill that I think sometimes does not really result, there's not much training on. Now, I was a newspaper reporter before I became a lawyer. So this is something that I've been doing for many years. And it's a skill that I think is extremely important. And I think is actually, uh, again, something that more people can develop, can work on developing uh, throughout their careers. So one thing about interviews that's kind of tricky is that obviously doing more interviews, I think is very helpful and you get better at doing interviews the more you do. But I do think it's actually helpful to actually try to look back and see about how other people have done interviews. Now, oftentimes you're not really gonna find in the real world, you know, real life interviews that you can look back on and, you know, from an early stage of the investigation. But actually looking at the Sherlock Holmes stories, Sherlock Holmes himself conducts several interviews, many interviews during the course of the stories. And I, would, I thought looking at some of these might actually be helpful in kind of hopefully showing some of the points that I'm trying to talk about here. So, what happens in the study in Scarlet is when Holmes leaves the murder scene, he actually has a very good sense of who the murderer is, um, and at least as a general name sense. He doesn't know the name of the murderer, but he's very sure of the murderer's role in, at the scene, who the murderer is as a general point. So the next thing he does is he goes to track down the constable, the police officer, who first heard about the murder and who first came to the murder scene. And that's a man named John Rant. So he goes to talk to John, Constable John Rant. And he does this because he wants to hear details about the murder scene for himself. So the interview starts off, and actually this is, uh, you can see the whole back and forth is in one of the handouts that's available for you if you, if you on the control panel. And also, by the way, I should, I should have mentioned this earlier, if you have any questions as I go, you know, please, answer, please pass them along and, you know, I'll try to address them, you know, when we get towards the end. Um, but if you want to follow along, you can do that. 
But what I've shown, what you see behind me or above me right now, is, is going to be actual a visual depiction, a kind of back and forth between Holmes and John Rance during the course of the interview, with the blue representing the question that Holmes asked, and the red or orange representing the Rance's response. Um, and this is showing that kind of with each kind of box representing about 10 words or so, 10 words or so, um, to kind of give a little bit of a sense of the back and flow of the interview, because that is really important. There are many different types of investigative interviews. Um, I generally classify them into three types, uh, fact gathering interviews, interrogations, and locking in. Um, and those have a very, all those interviews have a very different rhythm that goes about things, that is accompanies those interviews. So this is an example of a fact gathering interview, kind of probably the most common type of interview that people will do in terms of an investigation. And again, I think this is actually turns out to be a useful exercise, a useful interview to kind of study. So the first thing about this interview that I think is really important, maybe the most important thing about this interview is that Holmes did the interview at all. Now, he does not simply rely on what the witness already said in the past. Because when he shows up to interview John Rance, the first thing John Rance does is complain about being interviewed. Because he says, I already made it in my report at the office. I already said what I found. I already told, I already told other people what happened. So I don't need to talk to you. But Holmes responds, we thought that we should like to hear it all from your own lips. I think this is really important because Holmes, by talk, Holmes wants to talk to John Rand in order to get information that he finds important and to clarify details whether or not John Rand thinks they're important. Now, I think that's a really important thing for lawyers to be thinking about as they interview people. The things that, you're, that you think are important might not be the same things that the person you're interviewing thinks is important. And so sometimes, like just a lot of times, you actually have to go through all of this in order to find the details and the information that is useful for you, that's important for you, but which the witness might not think much of. And again, that's what actually happens during the course of this interview. So it begins, so first of all, Holmes does the interview at all. He shows up, he takes the effort to hear it all for himself. He starts talking to John Rand. And he begins the interview by simply just asking him to just, he just explain, tell us what happened. And so he actually starts the interview, uh, and that I think is actually useful because what he's doing at the beginning of the interview is he's actually, I'm doing a second thing, he's actually a little bit plain dumb. Uh, he's letting the, he's, he, Holmes already has figured out a lot of things, but he wants the witness to, he wants to hear from the witness, he wants to hear from the witness himself. And so he lets the witness begin the narrative. And he, so he just says, tell me what happened. Let us hear it all. And then Rand starts describing what happened. And then as it goes far enough, Holmes then stops him. And he clarifies details when necessary. So he steps in. He explains the things that he thinks he saw, the, Holmes, the things that Holmes observed from the scene. And he steps in. And he shows his knowledge when appropriate. He actually could, because he has a pretty good sense of what Rance did and what Rance saw at the scene. He wants to hear it from, from Rance himself, but he also wants to make sure he gets what he needs and confirms his understanding. So he starts off playing dumb, but he shows his knowledge when appropriate and when he needs to move things along. And he clarifies the details that are important to him. So that goes on for a little while. Then, Holmes asks a very standard question, but a very good question. What happened next? So really just trying to get him to, what did you do next? Really trying to break down the scene. Because what's happening here is that from Rance's point of view, he found a body, he found a murder scene, this is it, he's done with it. And for him, he's looking at it from his perspective, this is really simple and kind of almost kind of boring. But for Holmes, he needs to break it down, and one way he's doing that is by just kind of just taking it chronologically and just asking, okay, he set the scene, what did you do next? He gets the next little bit out. What did you do after that? What happened next? 
that's a good technique to slow down the interviews and to make sure you get all the things you want and need rather than basically taking it all in kind of one big, one big dump of information at the beginning. All right. So next we get to, I think, a very crucial part of the exchange from my point of view, which is when basically uh, Holmes asks Rance what happens afterwards because Holmes, Rance goes to the scene, he finds the body, he goes out into the street and Holmes asks him, was the street empty then? And the constable says, well, it was as far as anybody that could be of any good does. And then Holmes asks the crucial follow-up, what do you mean? This, I think, is a great example of how important it is to make sure when you're interviewing someone that you are using the same terminology because that is something that really people can get hung up on. From Rance's point of view, the street was empty because the only person that was out there was this guy who appeared to be a drunken bum, no one of import. So from Rance's perspective, it was empty. Now, Holmes made sure to understand that when Rand said empty, he didn't really mean empty the way Holmes understood it. And so that's a crucial thing that Holmes makes sure that he's using the same terminology as the person he's talking to. And I think that's extremely crucial, especially in complicated cases, to make sure that people are using the right, the same language. And I do think it's important in interviews sometimes to make sure you're using the same definitions or at least to understand the definitions that your witness is using when you're talking to them. This comes up a lot, I think, especially in white collar fraud cases where people can talk, people in their own head might think that what they're doing isn't necessarily fraud. But if you break it down, it can be what well, you might think is fraud um, or it might be part of a larger scheme that you might be able to show. So this was actually a, a crucial thing that I thought about when I was interviewing people back when, back when I was a prosecutor, making sure that we were all using the right terminology, same terminology. Now, by this point, Holmes actually, the interview, by this point in the interview, Holmes is actually pr pretty sure that the guy that John Rand thought was of no import, this guy he thought was just a drunken bum, was actually the murderer himself who was coming back to the scene for some reason that Holmes later figures out. So that's why now at this point of the interview, Holmes now focuses, rather than asking these open questions, he's now, he just needs to get the details he needs to advance the investigation. So here's where you see kind of the back and forth of the interview, the rhythm of the interview changing. Where at the beginning, it was much more open-ended. By the time, then you get, you get to the towards the end, that's where Holmes figures out what he needs. And then he's just asking much shorter, direct questions to get the details that he's looking for in order to advance to the next stage of the investigation. And by the time he's done, he is very sure that the guy that the inspector, Rant, that the constable Rance thought was of no import was actually the murderer himself, and that Rance had basically missed this huge opportunity to solve the murder from the very beginning. So this is kind of an example. This is, I think, is a pretty good example of how Holmes applies, I think, a lot of the things he uses in the course of this investigation. And I think hopefully a good example of kind of a back and forth, the back and forth that goes involved, that's involved in a fact gathering interview. All right, so by this stage of a study in Scarlet, which is, we're actually still very quickly into the story. I mean, this is really, I think by this point, we're just at the end of chapter four. But Holmes already knows who committed the murderer, though he does not know the murderer's name or motive. Now, what's interesting here, and I think significant, is that Holmes does not inform the police immediately about all this, and he continues on with his investigation. So he does many steps in the course of the rest of the study of Scarlet. He sets a lure for the murderer, who actually does manage to outsmart Holmes, at least for a little bit, by sending someone else into the trap rather than showing up himself. Holmes finds the poison that the murderer used to conduct the murders. And he tests the poison by giving it to a dog who, Holmes is very clear, was old and about to die anyway. And Holmes determines, confirms that the poison is in fact poison 
because the dog, he does basically kill the dog. Um, and then Holmes sets a second trap for the murderer and ultimately catches him when he shows up to 20, 221 B Baker Street. And I think this is a good example of of base and helps answer, I think, a second big question I want to talk about today, which is how does Holmes get the result? How does he, what are the steps? Why does he, why doesn't he just tell the police up front that the murderer is the guy who drove the cab to the murder scene and that all they need to do is go find that, find the cabbie? Why does he take these extra steps to build the case and to build, the, to go through all these other investigative steps? And I think that's, it goes to, um, and for that, I think a lot about basically a quote from a later Sherlock Holmes story, where Sherlock Holmes actually compares himself to his brother, Mycroft Holmes. Now, if you've seen the BBC TV series, uh, Sherlock, uh, or you've read the books, you know that Mycroft Holmes is actually supposed to be Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother. But... There's a big difference between Sherlock Holmes and his brother Mycroft. And this is Holmes talking. If the art of the detective began and ended in reasoning from an armchair, my brother would be the greatest criminal agent, greatest criminal investigator that ever lived. But he has no ambition and no energy. He was absolutely incapable of working out the practical point, which must be gone into before a case could be laid before a judge or jury. When you're a litigator, when you're investigating, knowing what happened is not enough. It's not good enough because what you must focus, you have to focus on what you can actually prove. Prove to a group of strangers who have not gone through the investigation that you've gone through and who don't necessarily have the same kind of gut instincts that you do. You actually have to make sure you know not you know not just what happened, but you had to have to gather the evidence and information to prove things uh, in a court. And that's something oftentimes that means getting more evidence than you think you might need. Now, so for here, when I think about this, I think a lot about in terms of practical points. I think one of the big things to think about are knowing during the course of investigation the elements of the case you're trying to make, whether it's criminal charges or whether it's civil cases, knowing all the things you actually have to show at the end of the day before a jury, but also knowing the rules of evidence, knowing the rules that are going to govern what, is, what that jury might actually get to hear months, maybe years later, because that's the evidence, that's the case that's going to actually matter, not what you have now. When Sherlock Holmes conducts, when he walked out of that murder scene, he knew that the murderer was the guy who went to the cabbie. But that's not good enough. He needs to be able to get the additional evidence to be able to explain it to a jury down the road who's not going to have the same insights that he has, who's not going to have that same wealth of knowledge and experience to draw upon that he does. So in terms of the rules of evidence, the, some of the crucial things I think often get, that I think get overlooked in the course of thinking about investigations or evaluating investigations are some basic rules of evidence. Largely foundation. A big thing, one of the big gov concepts for why, what evidence can be actually presented at a trial is establishing foundation for the evidence. Establishing that the evidence or the testimony that the jury might be about to hear is actually reliable and credible enough to be admitted at trial. So one of the big things that I think, one big part of that is understanding that anonymous information is basically useless except as a lead. Because if you don't know the source of an information, if you don't know who's providing it, it really can't, you really can't do much with it in court. So that's why kind of anonymous sources, really they might help provide you the next step along the line, but it's really not going to be the kind of thing that's going to hold up and having that, keeping that in mind as one does investigation. And the second thing, and very related to that, is understanding that information that's not, that is not based on a witness's personal knowledge is kind of useless, again, except as a lead. So 
what happens a lot of times is that I think a lot of times when people are conducting investigations and interviewing people, a lot of times they don't keep that basic foundation idea in mind. And so well, inter- I've seen many times when p- investigators have interviewed people and not figured out, not clarified whether what the witness is saying is based on their personal knowledge or based on something that they assume or have heard from someone else. Now, because what they assume is not really going to be admissible in a lot of cases. And what they heard from someone else is a lot of times not going to be admissible. It's the information that they personally observed. That's the information that the witness can actually testify to in court. So there have been times um, when I was a prosecutor, you know, uh, the way a lot of times when people, when, when law enforcement agents will interview people, they'll write up reports interview reports about what people said during the interviews. And I have often found times when I'll be getting ready for a trial and I'll be going through those interview reports and I'll meet the witness myself because I want to get ready for trial. I want to hear what they have to say. And I'll actually just sit there and I'll start realizing like, oh, all these things that I thought the witness was going to be able to say because it's said, it's laid out specifically in the interview report. It's really not based on any personal knowledge. It's based on things they heard. It's based on things they assumed. And they're really not useful for me. They're really not because they're not admissible. So I would sometimes just sit there and basically have those interview reports. And I would just basically say, okay, I got to cross that part out. I got to cross that part because all these things I thought this witness was going to say and did say, they can't say in court. Because a lot of times, sometimes the investigators who did these interviews didn't keep in mind that element, this idea of personal knowledge and making sure that the things that were that things that were recounted were based on personal knowledge. So a lot of times it's not clear. So that's a crucial aspect, I think, of litigating cases that I think sometimes gets overlooked. And I think that is a great example of kind of a practical point that Sherlock Holmes himself would kind of emphasize. You got to make sure you get the evidence that will actually hold up and will actually be admissible. And that, of course, requires knowing the rules. Another big thing that Sherlock Holmes did, and that, again, is, I think, extremely important for any kind of investigation or, or case, is really knowing, is really taking the effort to test your case and thinking about the other side. Now, Holmes himself talks about this. One should always look for a possible alternative and provide against it. It is the first rule of criminal investigation. Another quote, talking to Inspector. I really, Inspector thinks, I really think we should have, we have enough to go before a jury. Holmes, shaking his head. A clever counsel would tear it all to rags. A big aspect of conducting a successful investigation is really thinking, making sure it will actually hold up. Making sure now that you don't, that it's not just good enough for you, you know, right now, uh, thinking through things, but it's going to hold up if put to the test. Because a case that's going to go forward, when a, when a criminal charge gets filed, when a civil case is filed, if the other side doesn't simply roll over and plead guilty or, or, or settle, you've got to be able to go to, you're going to, you might have a trial and you might have a case where you're going to have to have your case tested by another side who is going to have a totally different, who's basically the entire goal is going to be to tear your case apart and get a different result. So it's important to think about that up front. It's important to think about that because you can do so much more in investigation in the early stages than you can years later. So a lot of the success of a good case depends on doing it up front rather than waiting to trial to do it. So this is something that was, I think, a key part of how Holmes investigated. He would change, again, change his perspective to think about things from the perspective of the person he was investigating, but also think about the perspective of the jury later on and the defense lawyer whom he might have to face down the road. And those are the things that he incorporated into his investigation so he would make sure he would actually take the time to build the case up front and to take those extra steps in the investigation, not because he actually needed information to know what happened, but because he needed additional evidence to make sure he could actually prove what happened 
to a group of strangers down the road. All right. Um, so a third thing that I think is a uh, that I think is an important topic uh, for or area for investigators based on Sherlock Holmes is thinking about how he organizes information. Now, so much of our work as lawyers is about information flow and organization. You probably will always have too much information in a particular case, and you need to find a way to process and organize the information. And Sherlock Holmes talked about this in the study of Scarlet. And this is an example of something that you might have heard about, and you may have seen scenes about this. You actually might have seen a scene about this in the BBC series uh, based on Sherlock Holmes. And basically, in a study in Scarlet, Sherlock Holmes talks about what he calls his brain addict. And stepping back, I think this is actually one of the most confusing parts of homeless methodology and the homeless mythology. And to be honest, I actually don't think it really makes much sense. Um, I don't think this is actually, this is what Dr. Watson says about Sherlock Holmes in Studying Scarlet, but I actually think that Holmes didn't actually operate this way. Uh, and actually part of the reason why I think that is because Arthur Conan Doyle or Dr. John Watson basically talks about this in later stories and explains different ways of how Sherlock Holmes thought. Now the ways explained in the study in Scarlet, as you can see here, Watson himself summarizes all the things that Sherlock Holmes doesn't know. And he basically, in the study of Scarlet, he talks about how uh, he, there's this whole discussion about how Sherlock Holmes is brilliant in so many areas, but he is woefully ignorant of many common topics, including famously whether the earth goes around the sun or the other way around. And when it comes up in the study of Scarlet and Watson expresses his, 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 his shock that Holmes doesn't know how the solar system works. Holmes proudly says, this is not relevant at all to my work. You told me this information and I'm gonna do my very best to forget about it. Now, that's what, that's what it said in the study of Scarlet, but I actually think that's not quite how Holmes himself operated. Because, and also I don't think this is a great way for an investigator to operate. Basically what Holmes is talking about here, what he's depicted here is saying in Study Scarlet, is that he, he, is, he basically limits his information, limits his perspective to the very specific thing that he knows for sure will be a part of his cases. And that he basically will run away from knowledge of any other topic uh, outside the case, the topics he thinks are relevant. And I just don't think that's a great way of organizing information or thinking about or approaching any kind of investigative mindset. And so this actually comes up, and I, I think actually Sir Arthur Conan Doyle himself kind of thought as time went on, one way or another, that the brain addict idea that Holmes described in the study of Scarlet wasn't quite the right thing for Holmes, because he, he actually talks about this in a few other later stories. So in studying Scarlet, the whole idea that he is a brain addict and he is diligent and specific about what goes in and anything that's not crucial to his investigations, he's gonna throw out. But that's not what he says in a later story. In a later story, it turns, he reveals that the brain addict is not quite as, as, as specific as it said in the story of Scarlet. In, a, in the five orange pips, it turns out that the brain addict, yeah, it still exists, but there's also this backup area. There's this whole annex. There's a lumber room that actually that attaches, where that's where you put everything else. So how the solar system works, how all these things go, yeah, that actually is still, that could be relevant. That could be relevant sometimes. It might not be at the forefront of your brain, but you still keep that knowledge and you still keep it where you can get it if you want it. And then later on in another story, actually in one of the very few stories that is written from Holmes' perspective in the first person sense, Holmes himself describes I hold a vast store of out-of-the-way knowledge of that scientific system, but very available for the needs of my work. My mind is like a crowded box room with packets of all sorts stowed away therein, so many that I may well have but a vague perception of what was there. So first of all, again, I think, I think the approach that Holmes supposedly takes in a study in Scarlet's 
I actually don't think that's actually the approach that that Holmes is described as having later on, based on these stories and based on the fact that, like, as you read these stories, it turns out Holmes knows lots of things about lots of random topics that you wouldn't expect him to know if you went back to just that one list of Watson had in Sonia Scarlet. So that's one thing. And that's how one aspect of how Holmes organized information, I think is kind of famous from a study of Scarlet. But it's actually, in some ways, not the crucial one, not the, not the crucial one for his investigative purposes. And that's the one that I want to talk about a little bit more. Because it turns out, in the later stories of Sherlock Holmes, that's when it turns out that he has this resource that he taps into on a regular basis in solving many of his cases. And that's an index that he has created. So what happens is Watson talks about in, in a scandal in Bohemia about how Holmes had adopted a system of docketing. So basically what comes up is that Holmes would read the London newspapers constantly and he would actually go ahead and he would save the newspapers and he would basically clip, unclip all sorts of things that he would find out about particular people. And he would create files for all sorts of prominent people, all sorts of prominent information. So he would have this resource that he could go back and look at in the course of his investigation. This is what Watson just says in The Scandal of Bohemia. For many years, he'd adopted a system of docketing all paragraphs concerning men and things. So that it was difficult to name a subject or person on which Holmes could not at once furnish information. Basically, Holmes made his own 19th century version of Wikipedia. He basically created his own encyclopedia and resource so that he could basically go back and search it for information about topics that might come up in the course of an investigation. So when he hears for the first time in a scandal of Bohemia about the, the Irene Adler, the woman, whom he calls, he actually already has a file on her. He already knows stuff about her because he already has collect information months or years in the past. Um, and he does, he has this resource that he can tap into basically in the course of his investigation. He basically absorbed lots of information so that he could make connections that other people could not. And I think there's a few things that are very crucial about that. First of all, he created it himself. So he didn't simply, this is not something that he bought off the shelf, right? It's not something that he had Watson do for him or he had hired people to do for him. He did it himself. He took the effort to actually go and find this information, to think about the information he's collecting and organizing and process and organize himself. And I think what this does, and I think it's a great example of how this kind of direct interaction with the material he's working with, it causes him to know the information better and to retain it better than more passive interaction would have resulted in. Uh, there's a great book that I, that, I, that, I, that I highly recommend called Make It Stick that actually talks about kind of how students can study better and how one way that, they, that the book recommends is really not simply rereading the same textbook or material over and over again, but doing things to interact with the material, to quiz yourself, to you know, talk about it with, other, with peers, things like that, because that helps make connections that help better retention, and that maybe helps you get better insights than simply reading the same material over and over again. I think that's what Holmes is doing here. I think by basically collecting all this information and organizing it, he's basically finding connections that other people might not be able to make because they're not engaging with the London newspapers the way he is. There are people more pe people are more often reading it passively. He's using it to build up the database, basically. And he uses this database. He consulted in many cases, and he uses it to check details. So, as a practical measure, um, when I was a prosecutor, uh, thinking about what my time as a prosecutor, I would often work up detailed charts about my cases long before trial, charts that no juror would ever see, but that helped me organize the case to help me 
make connections, and to figure things out. So one simple one that probably most litigators on this call have done is just creating a chronology, right? To put the events in sequence. Just make sure that you actually have everything in, in order so you know what happened. And you also know where the gaps might be, right? Because that's what a great doing a chronology can sometimes reveal. Like, oh, there's this actually, you know, we have a lot of things happening in these months, but there's this gap of six months or a year. Like, huh, I wonder what happened there. And that might be an area you can pursue and you might see more clearly by taking the time to step back and kind of preparing and studying a chronology. Uh, even if the juror, no juror would ever see it. Another thing that I've done in my cases to help organize things is actually take witnesses and actually do kind of a comparison. So to track what witnesses said about the same topics and the time periods that witnesses were there. When I was investigating, when, back in the old days when I was investigating a company, I would actually try to make sure that like, okay, did we cover in the interviews? Do we all cover the right topics with people? And by actually, I would create charts to show, oh, you know, it turns out that this person we interviewed early on in the investigation, you know, we didn't ask them about this one topic because we didn't even know about it back then, but we learned about it from a later interview. That's something that becomes more clear when I can see the blank spot on my chart. And that's a, that's a topic I'll go back to um, later on as I prepare for trial. Similarly. I could see sometimes that, oh, we've talked to a lot of witnesses who were there kind of in the later days of the scheme or later stages of the company, and we really don't have people from the beginning. And that's what's skewing the information we have because we're getting people who, don't, who weren't around at the key time periods that we're interested in or who were around to explain how things evolved. So those kind of stepping back and organizing your information, taking the time to do those things, they help you find the connections and build up your investigative leads that in a way that I think Holmes did. All right, um, so let me just quickly go through an interview where I think Holmes, which I think is a good example of Holmes himself using this in practical ways. So for this, I'm gonna turn to the second Sherlock Holmes novel, The Sign of the Four. And this is a case where basically it begins with Holmes being approached by Mary Morstan, who has this unusual circumstance going on where she's been getting these mysterious pearls on a kind of monthly basis, and she doesn't know why. And she's trying to figure out what happened. And she also is very concerned about her father, who died or disappeared years ago, and she never knew what happened to him. So here, what she does, so for this interview, and the interview here is a bit different than what we see with John Rand. And there's some reasons for that. First of all, Mary Morstan is just a better witness. She is someone who is far more interested in helping Holmes to begin with. And she's actually, to be honest, she's a lot smarter than John Rand. So when she comes in to be interviewed, when she comes in to tell Holmes what happened, she is much better at conveying like good information to Holmes from the get-go. So when, she, when Holmes starts off with the same basic questions, tell me what happened, she's able to provide a lot more good information up front. But then, as it goes, so Holmes listens to, to Mary Morstan, but then he asks a very specific question. He asks her about the date, the date that her father disappeared. Now, he's doing that because that's a specific detail that Mary Morstan didn't say in her narrative. It's a detail that she didn't think was important. But Holmes knows it's important because it gives him something to check. It gives him something outside the witness to look at and to investigate and to see if that helps reveal anything. So what he's doing here is he gets the date because he can then go back to his index. He can go back to his Wikipedia and check what happened around that date. And he can check what happened for some of the people who Mary Morstan mentions. And when he does that, he's able to actually pretty much solve the mysteries that Mary Morstan brought to him from the get-go. And then after he, so he gets that crucial detail, he gets the, he, so one big thing he interviews is looking for things, looking for the next lead, looking for things that you can check to corroborate your witness, things you can look for that might contradict your witness or show that your witness doesn't actually know what they're talking about, or looking for the next detail or possible lead. So he gets the date 
because that's a key thing he can check against his outside sources. And then from there, he then goes on and then he asks for additional information about what happened, uh, very specific details that she provides. And then he ends the interview by asking a very, just making general comments to really kind of cover, you know, just keep her talking. A singular case, he says at one point, really just to kind of like keep the, like basically keep the conversation going. Like, okay, you stopped. I'm going to say a singular case and see what you say. And then she actually goes on and talks some more and gives us more useful information. And then at the end, he wraps up by asking a very good, you know, wrap up question. You know, is there basically, is there anything else? Has anything else occurred to you? What often happens in the course of interviews is that when you talk to people, a lot of times they're not going to remember things at the beginning of the interview that they might remember by the end of the interview. Because talking about things, usually you're interviewing people who have not been thinking for days and days and days about the topics you're, you're interested in. You know, a lot of times you're talking to people who have tried very hard to put the events that you're interested in out of their mind and have not deliberately not thought about it for years. So here, you know, it's good as people talk, they, their re recollections might get refreshed and it's good to come back and wrap up by asking this kind of general question. So again, this is, I think, a good example. All of this, I think, helps show how, you know, Holmes is really trying to take all these different things together, including his information, the way he's organized information, his resources, really as investigative tools in the course of all this. Okay, so I just have a few more minutes left, but I wanna step back and share a bit about why I think this is important for everyone, lawyers and non-lawyers. And Holmes himself talks at one point in one in the Copper Beaches story, and he's this line that I think, this question that I think resonates with me. What do the public, the great unobserved public, who could hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction. Sherlock Holmes once asked his friend, Dr. John Watson, this question without getting an answer. But I believe that the public really does need to understand better how to investigate, and more importantly for the public, how to evaluate investigation. So much of our public discourse now is based on investigations that we are not ourselves conducting. And a lot of times, people don't have the good tools or structures on how to conduct investigations or how to evaluate the quality of the investigations that we hear about in the news. And so for this, I come back to the rules of evidence. We all need to evaluate inf evidence information. As lawyers, I actually think we're sometimes fortunate that we do have a structure because we have the rules of evidence to think about. And we have ideas that these concepts of burden of proof. And I think these are things that we are actually lucky as lawyers to have, and sometimes I wish more the public understood as well, could keep that in mind. And I think one thing, but maybe one core idea there, is this idea of foundation and personal knowledge. Because sometimes we have so many cases, so many instances, where people are saying things without really having the personal knowledge or, or the expertise to really know what they're saying. And a lot of times, unfortunately, that can have consequences um, in so many ways. So um, I hope this has been useful. I hope this has been educational and interesting. I mean, there's a lot of more I could talk about, uh, about Sherlock Holmes' investigative techniques. Um, as I wrap up, there's a few things I just need to cover. Uh, first of all, the code for CLE purposes is, I have it. The code for CLE purposes is 12122. Again, it's 12122. And finally, I just want to wrap up by just saying that uh, thanking you all for being here today, uh, thanking the FBA for hosting this webinar. Uh, if you have uh, any thoughts or questions, I'd be happy, please contact me. I'd be happy to discuss this further. You can find me on LinkedIn or at the two websites uh, you see here. And I'll actually uh, post online on, on LinkedIn some additional resources that I think might be useful if you, if you found this interesting. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can, I, I'm not sure if we can take any, but at this point, uh, but uh, thanks, for, thanks for being here.
I guess I'm not sure about 